Thursday, December 28th. It's been a minute. Is that what they say when you haven't seen somebody in a long time? They say it's been a minute. How are you, Dan, yeah. Nathan? Uh, By the no, way, it's Market yeah. Call, Fact Set, yeah. Financial Data and Analytics, powered by tomorrow. There are also, and Carter Worth is joining us. Uh, big show on tap. How are you? Big show. I mean, it is. it has been a minute, Guy. I feel like I haven't seen you. Um, we potted a lot this year. We've done a lot of live broadcasts for the Market Call. we got to give a shout-out, not just to our great friends at FactSet who have been with us the whole journey, not just in 2023, but from the get-go in 2021, we've had different iterations of Market Call, and this is what we've arrived at. We really dig this name, right? I think that was probably a 2022 thing. Obviously, we want to thank our friends at SoFi. Get your money right, guy, all in one app. And of course, CME Group has been with us all from the get go, also, right? And you know what? Where risk meets opportunity. Yeah, and that's and what we're going to do here today. No, well, that's what we're going to do. And quickly, yeah. you know, typically when people want to surf, they go out. What, what I used to do back in the day, we'd surf Mavericks. And that was before anybody really had ever heard of Mavericks. <laughs> yeah, they go, yeah. Bonsai Pipeline, or they go out yeah. to Nazare in Portugal. Those are the places. As it turns out, the Jersey Shore was a bit of a surfing uh, mecca a couple weeks ago. There were like 15 to 20 foot waves and parts wow. of the Jersey Shore on the back of that storm, which is crazy. I didn't have an opportunity to get down there because my wetsuit wasn't here, but I would have surfed that, Dan. Yeah, you would. I'm actually on the coast in SoCal. I'm just north of San Diego right now, and I just see the whole beach dotted with surfers as I look out across my window here, which go. is kind of cool here. All right, Guy, we have a very specific mission today. We have a friend of ours who's been with us also from the get-go. Um, that would be Carter Braxton Worth. We're going to do a little our chart, his chart, and we're going to look at these things as we think about some of the biggest macro charts for 2023, as we head into 2024, we're going to be flashing up our fact set chart. This is really what we're looking at from a trading perspective, and Carter's going to drill down uh -huh. on, a, a, on a few more here. We also are going to take a look at the TLT, the iShares 20-year U.S. Treasury ETF. Um, he's got a really interesting call on yields, and he's been spot on on yields over the last few months or so. Um, and we're going to trade it with the options, um, and we're going to do a couple other things here. So, Guy, should we just bring him in right now? Get 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 it to it right out of the gate. Here? Let's bring him in, and it's interesting that we're bringing him in at the top of the hour. And we have a TLT chart because, not that I know this, but my sense is there was just some bond auction that didn't go particularly well because the what TLT sold off and uh, the S and P sold off. But listen, that's why we're here. How are you, Carter Braxton? How are you? I'm good. You heard Carter, Carter what, do you think, what, what, what do you think of our chart, your chart, our chart, your chart? Here, and again, look, it's, uh, I preface it. I all preface charts it, are good. I'm all for any chart. If it's I know, chart, but I, I, I preface it by saying. representation of price, right? That's good. We're the dumb trader guys. We're pulling them up on our fact set machine. You know, we're seeing what we see. I want to start with this one, um, Guy, and maybe you have some thoughts here too. This is the S&P 500 versus the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. It's a two-year chart, okay? And what I find interesting this year about the SPX, and we'll 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 kind of bang this one out, and we'll spend some time on it our, on our own here. Is that it? Really is. Look at that. You know, we were basically forty eight hundred to start out twenty twenty two, and here we are. We're approaching forty eight hundred again. But the fascinating thing about the yields, and we know what's going on over the last two years in yields, is that the ten year was at one and a half percent or so last time the S and P was at forty eight hundred. Guy. Well, now we have a situation where. 5% down to 385 or whatever we got to 382 or something like that. You know, something's got to give pretty soon. Guy, when you look at this chart, what is what is your trading brain saying? So you look at this and again, the S&P 500 is obviously in the white. So as yields went high and it started at the beginning, as yields started to climb higher in a meaningful way, you started to see the S&P take notice and sell off in a meaningful way. And then you can start to go through this and say, okay, when yields did a back and fill, that's when the market sort of got back on its horse. But there's clearly, at a certain point, there's a bit of a disconnect, right? So now you see this big move lower in yields. And one has to ask himself, you know, what's going to be the next leg of this thing? How is it going to sort of reconcile itself? Now, I agree with you, and we're going to look at this trade, but I think there's going to be so this day of reckoning coming where the S&P starts to give it back. 
and the 10 year yields start to get back on their horse. Um, but that's what makes markets, Dan. That's how I look at this. Yeah. Hey, so Carter, when when Guy talks about that disconnect, it's kind of interesting that there was a period this summer where lots of folks thought that yields could continue to go higher with stocks or stocks could go higher with yields. And at one point in the not so, you know, in, 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 you know, a couple months ago, that was a big, big disconnect because the higher the yields went is the lower stocks went here. So thoughts when you look at this sort of relationship right here. I mean, generally speaking, the relationship is inverse, right? The relationships can be inverse or direct. And over time, of course, there is a, a long-term inverse relationship between lower cost of money and generally higher equity prices or higher multiples assigned to an earnings growth. Um, but what is particularly obviously pronounced is the the extremes in October, right? When um, when the S&P was at its low in October, obviously yields had spiked to four or five. And then, of course, this recent zigzag, the yields getting above five, higher for longer becomes a mantra. Uh, and then all of that has been quite wrong, actually. And then yields have collapsed and stocks have surged. At, at the end of the day, as one uh, large uh, mutual fund, uh, large cap growth manager uh, it repeats to me often, he said, Carter, I I as long as it's sort of five, five and a quarter to three and a half, it's Goldilocks, uh, you start getting below three and a half, it's going to mean something and it's going to mean something bad. Um, and so for now, I know uh, maybe it is Goldilocks, uh, yeah. but a great deal, if not all of the intermediate prospects for the market have been priced in. That would be my, we're on our ninth week uh, up in a row. Not that there's any magic to being up nine weeks versus eight in a row versus 10, but we've come a long way since that October low. And this move has saved the market. Remember on the October low, the Dow was down for the year. Meaning here we were getting into the end of October and the oldest index of all was down. Mm -hmm. And this ricochet has saved not only the Dow, of course, the S&P and so forth. So how much more, uh, before there is a normal garden variety dip, correction, sell off, drop, decline, drawdown, uh, who knows? Januarys are typically good, and yet some Januarys have been especially bad as people hold off, not wanting to uh, engage the tax man, only to sell aggressively in January. Yeah, Guy, and that's something that's interesting. Let's pull up the S&P maybe, and then we'll do the NDX before we get to yields here a little bit. Because if you think we've been talking a lot about the concentration, you know, those top seven or eight names make up 30% of the S&P 500. They make up 50% of the NDX. And so, Guy, like that sort of idea that you'd be holding onto a Microsoft or an Apple that just made new all-time highs, you know, some of the other ones, most of the other ones are making 52-week highs. There's, I think Tesla is a bit of an exception, which is, you know, um, still off of its 52 week and, and well off its all time highs. Um, does, is that something that, you know, the January effect that you think a lot of our listeners, a lot of our viewers should kind of be focused on? And the idea that some of these stocks might pull back a little bit might be the best thing if you are in the bullish soft landing camp, because right now f things feel like they're kind of on a, a, on a blow off sort of trajectory. The, if you just if you're hoping for a continue, sort of this unabated move higher in perpetuity, I think you're rooting for the wrong thing because it never happens. So I think you want to sort of take your medicine early next year and hopefully you get a back half that gets to the price targets that people are looking for in terms of the S&P. But, you know, I look at this and I go back to some of the things we talked about in the fall with Carter. You know, he brought forth those those charts that indicated a number of gaps left and there was one gap to be filled on the upside we did that a few weeks ago uh now there are, i think five if not six unfilled gaps to the downside so when i look at this chart and i have those things sort of ringing in my ear i say again there's an this inevitability that we go back and look at the 200 day moving i think this is the 200 day moving average in the form of sort of 4400 or so and then start to fill some of those gaps on the downside which counterintuitively be the healthiest thing for the broader market. Yeah. And, and Carter, maybe you want to walk us through the SPX and the NDX, because if we look at just the NDX, sure. which is up 20% from that late October low, right? And the S&P is up nearly 17%. It, you know, it does feel, you know, we use, we throw words around like parabolic and the like, but it looks like kind of a pretty straight line in both of them. Yeah. I And, and, and look, you're returning to a former high, which, uh, Typically, you'll have to contend with a high before exceeding it, which is to say back and fill or back away. It's not always the case. You know, the semis, uh, the NASDAQ 100 have blown through their highs. But any way you cut it, um, there are only three time frames, right? There's minor, intermediate, major. 
Now, this is a fairly mature intermediate advance, October 27 to now call it end of the year, uh, both in terms of duration uh, and magnitude. And so uh, at a minimum, you know, you you hedge, you write some calls, uh, you you trim, you take some measures. Because the alternative, of course, what about, I don't know, we should double our positions, get doubly long here? I, it just doesn't make sense to me. But uh, two ways to draw the lines, one, two, second iteration. Is it going to be, uh, you know, a double top where we struggle and fail? But either way, when you do get back to a former high, usually you back and fill or back away, and I would anticipate that. Yeah. Hey, and, and again, you know, the NASDAQ doesn't look too different, um, Carter. I mean, talk mm -hmm. us through the, the index, one, uh, the NDX 100, yeah, because the if you think about the through, concentration yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. The index has gone through the former high, as you've uh, depicted it here. Now, I've chosen to make a more definitive uh, conclusion here. Now, let's do this. This is arithmetic. Look at the next one. It's logarithmic. And, and so that, that's important. We can kind of toggle. And there's a a lot to be said for looking at both arithmetic charts and a logarithmic charts. But anyway, you slice it, we have the same circumstance. And remember, just to put this in context, the sell-off in the NASDAQ 100 was 37% versus 27% for the S&P. And so the recovery has been greater. But you know that the NASDAQ has not recouped, even though it's making slight new highs, all of its relative losses since that peak and the first days of 2022. Having sold off 37% versus 27, you have to climb back a good deal more just to get back to even. But I mean, this is the circumstance for equities in general. An important sell-off, a bear market by all accounts in 2022, and then an important recovery in 2023, leaving us now back to where we started. And one other thing I would point out, and this is phenomenal, um, um, strategists, as tracked uh, by the street, sell side, these are sell side major broker dealer strategists, um, put out year end targets. It's a relatively silly Wall Street convention. It only started about 40, 45 years ago. If you look back at some of the older reports from EF Hutton and Payne Weber, they never were so, I would say, um, self involved and sort of to impute to oneself such insight as to know where the market will end up 12 months in, in the future. But it's become a comfort blanket and something that Wall Street strategists are required to do by their bosses and so forth. But right now, you won't believe this, the year forward target is basically calling for around 5,000 with earnings on the S&P of $230. Do you know this week, exactly two years ago, Christmas of 2021, when the projections were for 2022, guess what it was? Exactly the same. Mm, Wall yeah. Street was predicting 230 in earnings and basically 5,000. So the, their prediction for 2024 is the exact same it was for 2022. Like, what do you do with that? I'll tell you what to do it. You crumple it up. I should get a piece of paper like this. <laughs> and then you do this. Poof, it's useless. Love that. I love Carter Braxton Worth. I, I'm going to say this, Dan. You know, I think still. We're going to look back at some point next year. We're going to look back on December 19th, Carter, when we had that huge reversal day. You know, I think we made, I want to say we might have made a new high in the S&P, reversed lower on pretty significant volumes. A lot of those stocks reversed lower. I still think we're going to go back, despite the fact that we've sort of levitated on a couple of trading days since, we're going to go back and look at that day as sort of a, I don't know, a bit of a benchmark that we're going to be talking about for a while. With that said, one of the things that have been really interesting, and maybe it's the new crude oil, as Tim Seymour says, is semiconductors. And you brought some charts with the semis because they've been off to the races. And now you're getting some participation from names that we haven't talked about in a while, like Intel. So let's talk about this. Yeah, so now semis, the, the, the setup is similar, but it, semis have now exceeded their um, uh, late 2021, early 22 highs. And so one could say, yeah, and there's your answer for the S&P, you dope. That's exactly what's going to happen for the market is the leading indicator and so forth. But remember, the semis, um, the semis are still below their peak on a relative basis from the dot-com era, meaning semis are still playing catch-up, having had a, such an excessive move. Uh, I, I like semis here because of the improvement both at the weekend and this is happening as NVIDIA has stalled for almost three months. And that speaks to the breadth in that uh, area of the market. I, I like semis over Qs, and I like semis, interestingly, over uh, the S&P. Now, this comparative chart, 
uh, puts in context how much semis are ahead of the S&P on a five-year, uh, six-year basis. But again, semis are way below the S&P still from the dot-com peak. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that you mentioned that um, that NVIDIA really has stalled, right? It had that gap in May above 350, and it spent the better part of the last four months between 400 and 500. There's been lots of good results and, and good guidance, and the stock has not really made a meaningfully new high. But then you have stocks like AMD that are up 60% in two and a half months. Like to Guy's point, Intel just joined the party. And I want to I want to um, bring that chart up I had of the S&P versus yields again, if they could do that really quickly. And, and, and you know, it's interesting. Interesting when you think about the Nasdaq in late 2021 topped out right at, right in November when the Fed signaled the pivot right towards the raise. So we saw crypto, we saw SPACs, we saw non profitable tech, recent IPOs. They all started getting killed, right? But the S and P made a new high, right? Uh, like a month later or so. And so I think that's really interesting because again, it's a decent segue back to yields. So now here we are, two years later, the S and P is back at those levels, and once again. Yeah, the Fed has pivoted supposedly, and now they're going to go the opposite way, or at least that's what a lot of investors and in equities are thinking. So, Carter, when you think about yields and their impact on kind of long duration assets, right, and, and the like, I think that's the, the key focus here. But what would happen? I know that you were expecting a drop from five to four. You've even said that you could see lower in the 10 year yield. Where do you see the next move in yields? I know you have a report out. And we're charting uh, because I want to. I, I, I guess we want to look through it through through the lens of the TLT because I have a trade idea there that I think corresponds with your view. But I think this is really important. You think is enough is enough um, from that move down from five percent in the ten year. Right. So again, it's always uh, knowing who one is in the market, knowing oneself what your time frames are. Uh, I'm in the lower, lower, lower yields camp. Right, which is to say, I think the message of crude oil dropping from 95 to 65, the message in the dollar collapsing, the message in rates dropping from above five to three seven here, three eight, is uh, that things are obviously uh, slowing and that there will be uh, ultimately a give back in equities. But on an intermediate basis, this is a one way train. We've dropped from 5.02 percent in yields to uh, three seven five or thereabouts. And this is typically where you get some sort of counter trend, right? And, and you can have a both short-term views and longer-term views, which makes sense, just as one can uh, think at any given moment that Microsoft is overdone and, and one could sell calls, but doesn't mean you sell your long-term Microsoft holdings. And so, again, knowing uh, what your objectives are in the market, what your timeframes are, um, I'm in the lower yields camp. I think we're going as low as three and beyond. Uh, but here and now, this unrelenting nine-week uh, almost 10 week drop from above five uh, to now 375. I think you start to play for a bump up in yields and a bump up in the dollar that it's all going to happen about the same time. Yeah, it's interesting. And I mentioned at the top of the show, Dan, it's something, I, again, I think there must have been an auction today. I should know, but I don't. But the, the way the market traded indicates mm -hmm. there was. And, you know, I agree the downtrend is still intact, but that doesn't mean we can't trade up to the downtrend line and even maybe sort of, I don't know, get through it. I don't know if we're going to test the moving average, but. I think even if you believe yields are going lower, which clearly Carter does, over this course of time since October, there have been periods where yields have spiked. And I think we're on the precipice of something like that. So you look at it here, could we test back up to sort of that 395 to 4% level in yields? Yes. And you're going to do it through the lens of the TLT. Yeah, Carter, walk us through what you're yeah. seeing because again, we were just focused on the 10 year and 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 again, I think the 200 is, you know, uh 4%, the uh 150 that you like to look at um is a bit higher. When you see a move back to like a like let's say a retest of a downtrend like we we're at 42 um in your um 150 day, mm -hmm. would that be a reasonable target in the near term before you were to make um, you know, lower lows and kind of retest that three and a half level to the downside? Right. I mean, I I'm thinking sort of 410, maybe that kind of yeah. thing. And we might have some TLT charts, which of course is price instead of yield. Uh, but but uh, look, this is a big move. Uh, you know, if that were, it doesn't matter if that were a, a Chinese internet stock or if it were, a, you know, a regional bank or whatever, something that's had a big ricochet. Um, uh, does it have to, uh, you know, collapse here and make new lows? No, but it's, it's a again, a mature intermediate advance, in this case, carrying what, from 82, 83 to 100? 
uh, an eight dollar stock going to ten, ten fifty. Uh, you know, do you do you just stay long play? No, you you trim, you write calls, you put on a risk reversal, you do something. I think so. That's one way to draw the lines. The other way, if we just toggle, you know, look, it's a big move above a downtrend line, and it's back to a level where the overhead supply now is in play. So uh, at a minimum, I think I would, uh, with new money, I'd rather be short than long. But with an existing big position, I'd certainly want to reduce it. Uh, you know, sometimes it's okay to book some gains to harvest. Yeah, Guy, you're in the higher um, yields camp. Um, and where would you see like this? Could you see a move back towards that 110 in the TLT? Because Carter, just as you referenced the breakdown level from a few months ago in the TLT, if you look at the resistance level, right, from earlier this year up at that 110 level, you know, if you were, um, you know, in, in the, in the uh, lower if you were in the lower yield camp, right, like right out of the gate, like th like this was it, that you know you could have a straight shot from 100 to 110. I, guy, I'm just curious, like thoughts on this because you're on the you are clearly on the other side of Carter's more long term view. Yeah, but which has clearly been wrong, by the way. But let's just play it out. So if we get back to the so that channel you see, if we get to the 110 level. 110, Carter, and I don't, I don't have the math in front of me. Probably gets 10 year yields down almost to that 3-6 level that you've been highlighting. And I'll tell you, if that's in fact the case, Dan, something something yeah. is happening in the equity market that I don't think any of us necessarily anticipate. But I'm more in the short term with Carter. So we're going to line up. You know, we're going to part ways at some point, but right now we're going to line up. You know, I think there's a chance that the TLT sells off. We probably get back down to the 90, 91 and a half level that I thought was going to be resistance on the way up. And that should probably line up with yields in 10 year somewhere around, I want to say, four, two ish, if not a tad higher. Well, listen, it's funny, guy, that you said, which has clearly been wrong. I mean, you were in the camp when yields were at three that they were going to four. And then when they got to four, they were going to five. And to Carter's point, I think you said it really uh, poetically. It all depends who you are in the market, right? And time frames are really important. So, uh, I mean, you guys could both be right on this one. So I, I think it's kind of interesting. I, I look at this through the lens of the options market. When I see Carter's charts and I say to myself, I agree with him. I see a move back towards if we want to toggle back to that downtrend and how much we've overshot it if you look and see where that downtrend is that gets you that back towards ninety dollars i mean that could happen fairly quickly and options i gotta tell you like they look fairly cheap they're usually very cheap um in vol terms and in, in, in an etf like the tlt so i want to look out to march expiration i want to go along with carter here so today when the tlt was trading about a hundred dollars i could buy the march 190 put spread paying about two dollars and fifty cents for that buying one of the march 100 puts for about two dollars and 85 cents selling one of the March 90 puts at about 35 cents. Again, 250 is my max loss there. I have profits up to 750 between 97 and a half and 90 bucks with a max gain of 70, uh, seven and a half below 90 and losses up to 250 between 97 and a half and 100 with a max loss of 250 above 100. You know, this is really simple rationale here. I am risking two and a half percent of the ETF price. I have a max potential gain of seven and a half percent of the ETF price if it's down 10 percent in two and a half months. And I just kind of like the risk reward here. I like the way that everybody from a sentiment standpoint is on one side of this trade here. And I just want to say this, we're going to do a lot more options trades in the new year's. As just a matter of principle, when we're doing long premium directional trade ideas using options, we're going to use a 50% stop. So if this ETF, okay, starts to go the opposite way, starts to go higher, right? And the premium that I paid two and a half is basically cut in half. It gets down to like one in 25 or something like that. I'm going to cut my losses here. The last thing we want to do is have long premium directional option trades go to zero. So we want to manage the risk in these sorts of trades. And the flip side of that, if this thing starts going in the direction that I hope it to, which would be lower, and I have a double, I'm going to look to take half off and keep the other half on and let that run and see if it can get down to my price objective down there at 90. And just really quickly, here's my chart on this one. I'm looking at a one-year chart here. We're at that resistance level, which was that breakdown level from uh, the spring, summer, um, if you will. And then you see that steep uptrend. If we break that and we go back towards that kind of $90 level, that is a, a reasonable target for me. Guy, thoughts on that and that time frame of kind of two and a half months and the risk reward that I'm targeting here? Yeah, I think it's going to happen a lot faster, but you're giving yourself enough time. The back of the envelope math, it's a three to one, four against, but obviously you're going to sort of manage that in between. So 
you know, with the stops in place and stuff, I mean, you can get up almost to five, six to one in terms of, uh, you know, your advantage, understanding the percentages with that six to one, probably a little bit skewed against you. But I think this is going to happen. I think it's going to play out relatively quickly. So that move to 90, I mean, we've seen parabolic moves to the upside. I think you could easily see what we used to call in a business, a line job to the downside and get us down there and have a move in yields up to four and a quarter. So my sense is my instincts suggest you're going to know if you're right in this thing over the next 30 to 35 trading days. Yeah. And that's trading too. I mean, I think all of us would be in the camp if, if we were to have yields, you know, move that much higher that quickly, we'd look to be taking the other side of it. Guy, you and I maybe for some fundamental reasons, Carter, for just some technical reasons. Um, Let's run through, we don't have a lot of time here. Let, let's run through some of these really uh, other important macro inputs. Let's look at crude oil here. Um, Guy, you and I, you know, here's a five-year chart. Um, You know, we're, we're kind of at levels when we got down to the high sixties or so just to our eye, right? Like, it looked like this is something that feels very heavy to me, guys. And and just like on a five-year basis, Carter, um, it, it definitely feels like we're, we're challenging a support level. I know my line's not perfect. We'd love to see how you're thinking about it because obviously this is just, um, you know, sure. there's a bunch well, of traders you know, throwing up some time frame. Oh, up. The, the, the thing to do, you remember those of us of a certain age, born in the 60s, you know, we used to have typewriters with whiteout and you get rid of your... <laughs> What I would do is black out. So when this is a black background, I would black out the spike associated with Ukraine invasion. So anything above 110, black it out. And I would black out that dump down to 30 associated with COVID. Those two extremes are for reasons, well, I mean, literally invasion, war, land war in Europe, and a COVID, a pandemic, a 100-year storm, a plague. So the question is, if you, if you think of it that way, you know, breaking down here, uh, and that's uh, what's likely in the case of a real slowdown and or more China trouble or just a recession. I mean, you have to think that it's going to be into the low 60s. But let's look at the um, the here and now. Three distinct rallies, plus 11%, plus 10.3, plus 12 and a half, all very similar to a magnitude and duration. Put in the downtrend line, put in the red arrow. Uh, you know, uh, uh, that's how I'd play it. Mm-hmm. And that's been right, Dan. I got to be honest with you, since late summer, early fall, I mean, it's been right to be bearish of crude and it's been right to be bearish every time it's bounced and it appeared as though it was going to take that next leg higher. So kudos to both of you. But what's interesting, even in the midst of this, you know, you've seen the big cap integrated names trade pretty poorly, but then you've seen some of these levered names like a PSX and a Marathon Petroleum within today, within earshot of an all-time high, which we made over the last couple of weeks. So crude oil is a bit of a conundrum here. There's so many, obviously, geopolitical reasons to be bullish, but that has not played into the price whatsoever, Dan. Yeah. And, and Carter, obviously, this is, uh, you know, the dollar and, and the relationship there is kind of important. You know, here's our chart really quickly. Um, you know, it's interesting, this kind of $100 level in the Dixie, the US dollar index um, seems to be a level we bounced there a few months ago or so. Maybe there's not a lot of authority, as you would say, in the line that we drew, but that's why you're here, man. Help us out with the Dixie. Uh, you know, so just as I think it's right to play for a bump up in yields, if we look at the short term dollar trend, you know, just it calls for oil did it. Uh, rates have not, um, dollar is not, but I think just as you saw a little bit of a bump up. In oil, one would say, no, no, you see the bump up in oil is because of the tanker thing and the Red Sea and the missiles. Why would you get it? Listen, people are always grasping for a why. I'm not in the why business. I'm in the what business. And what we see here is something that's very similar to rates and to oil. Oil's bounced. At some point, it gets extreme. I think rates are going to bump up again for 10, thereabouts. And I think dollar, you play it for a sort of minimum. If you've been properly short, let's say it that way, I'd cover with new money, small longs. You know, if a dollar does bounce here, you know, gold, which I know we've talked about, which I think made an all-time high today, might be in a bit of jeopardy. And I'm, if we fail here, Carter and or Dan, if we fail at these levels again, I'd be, I, I might even throw in the towel in 2024 and say it's just not meant to be. But if gold holds in there in the face of what Carter thinks is a bit of a dollar bounce here, then I think we're going to be talking about significantly higher gold, Dan, in 2024. 
Yeah, listen, you, you've had um, you've been right to play this thing on every pullback guy, and I think that you what you just reflected is a little frustration at this twenty one hundred dollar level in, in gold, and you know um, the fundamentals for gold in the sort of environment we're in, it seems like contrary to one of the reasons that a lot of people own gold for, right? And so I, I, I'm kind of with you from a technical standpoint, and there's a lot of people are just opposed to gold for a whole host of reasons, right? But if you took the name off of that, you told me this is some company developing some great generative AI tool and you know something like that, trades a little expensive to the market. I want to play that for a breakout uh, because that thing has been consolidating now for a few years or so. Carter, talk to us because you've been on this, this long gold train with guy also um thoughts here i think the, yeah. the, i think the arrows speak for themselves they sure do yeah i mean here's the thing about it the the the, the, the movement in oil 65 the 95 back to 65 is all in the last six eight months a uh, dollar two this is a three year range and we just pushed above it and it was called as a key reversal outside failure it's total nonsense we're back above it i i think it's going to be one of the best performing assets in 2024. I would also point this out that we know we're coming up on the two year anniversary of the market high. So Jan 4, uh, 2022 uh, was the S&P high and we're essentially there now and we're about to be Jan 4, 2024. Two years later, the S&P is unchanged and gold's up 14%. Gold's one of the, beat the hell out of the NASDAQ 100. So since equities peaked, one could have done a lot of things. But the best thing one could have done has been in gold. I'm with you, Dubs. And you know the reasons why I believe in it. In 2022, central banks bought a record amount. In 2023, they acted in kind. I've said for a while that they're hedging. Well, I've, I've said ineptitude, but quite frankly, it looks as though as this Federal Reserve is threading the needle. But there's many chapters left to be written on that front, Dan. But I can't for the life of me believe we're going to fail here yet again in gold. So I look at Carter's chart. And in my belief that it's going higher is further galvanized. Yeah. And just to, just to, like, listen, one of the reasons we, we wanted to do one market call this week, we wanted to get Carter back on. We wanted to hit some of the, the, the kind of the major um, indices and, 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 and macro sort of, um, you know, vehicles here, because we think the macro is going to play a really important part, um, you know, next year in 2024. There's a lot of different cross currents going on from geopolitical to elections to, you know, a whole host of things here. And again, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time. Last week, we spent a whole show just doing some sectors in the S&P. Some shows, we're just going to focus on individual names and uh, catalysts, but whether it be earnings season and the like. And we're going to be in Q4 earnings season in like two weeks when the banks start. So we're going to start uh, doing a lot of that. We're going to do a lot of trade ideas. And I love how Carter, you know, when he was talking about the NASDAQ, right, he was saying, well, it actually, it, you know, those charts should stimulate some sort of action, right, by you. If, if you come back 20% from a really negative period in October where people were just kind of baby with the bathwater, right? And now we're all the way back towards those prior highs at the very least, maybe sell some calls, right? You don't have to let go of your biggest positions, that sort of thing. So we're going to focus a lot on a lot of tactical sort of positioning in and around individual names and sector ETFs and, and, and major indices and commodities and currencies and the like here. That's all coming in 2024. Carter, we want to thank you, you and, and, and Kim and your team have been stalwarts with us all year long on Market Call and helping our listeners and our viewers navigate these difficult markets. And, and the work that you do, as Guy would say, is exceptional. So thank you to the whole team at Worth Charting. Uh, all the love. And of course, things can be fun. Things can be productive. But if you have them both together, you got some. I agree, Carter. You are you know the way I think of you. And we've known each other now for, the, I want to say, the better part of 16, 17 years. And it's been an honor being able to do this with you at least a couple times a week, if not more. Thank you. And before we get out of here, Dan, I'll just say this, folks, keep your eye on where the TLT closes today. Um, really interesting weakness uh, that's been taking place ever since we started today's show around one o'clock. So keep your eye on that. Dan, thank you. Carter Braxton Worth, thank you. I want to obviously thank the audience. Want to thank FactSet, Dan, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. Tomorrow will be Friday. Probably won't see us unless something dramatic happens. Monday, New Year's Day, you won't see us, but we will certainly be back 
on January 2nd, which, yeah, if we... memory serves, is Tuesday, Dan, Nathan. Yeah, and, and thank you, you guys. We know that you guys have a lot of fun with our team in, in the comments section on the YouTube, but we got to thank Amanda Diaz and Jacob Halex and Steve Rafis and Timmy Adami for all the help that they do behind the scenes because we couldn't do it without them, Guy, could we? No, definitely not. This is not... You might see our faces, but there are a lot of people working behind the scenes and we obviously can't do it without them either. So thank you all. Thanks to the audience. Have a very happy new year and we'll see you next week. All right. Happy new year.